Hello. Today I wish to talk about something. The Shredding Greens, an ongoing contradiction politically. Jenny Leong, the member of the Greens, wanted to say something in a video recently. Let me get the right. Screen the right time map. Here we go. Many of us have continued to suffer through an increase in anti-Asian racism and distrust, and there are real consequences for this. A member of the New South Wales Parliament had their house raided by ASIO. New South Wales councillors with Chinese heritage have received letters and death threats. Reports documenting discrimination in the media, barriers for people working in the public service, increases in racist attacks, citizens having their loyalties questioned at Senate committees, universities being subjected to foreign interference laws, the Human Rights Commission being criticised for their racism, it stops with me campaign, and then there's the endless tirade of racist crap and so-called jokes hold at public figures. This is not a... <clears throat> in this, in rhetoric, it is 100% one, one correct as there is much, there's, as there is full consequences for such actions, but as I go later with the Greens, but as a whole, that has not helped much over the years. And also, I could not agree more with the later part said about questioning of loyalties and so on, uh, which I'll go into later with the contradictions when, when, I talk about, when I talk about David Shoebridge in a fallen gong. We know we'll no longer be your model migrants. You will not stereotype us as geeks. You will not objectify us as the subject of your exotic fantasies. And we will not shy away from speaking proudly about our cultural heritage for fear that you will brand us as apologists for the Chinese Communist Party. On top of this... Well said again, but, but when I show the publication, some stuff said it will show a different image when they actively go against, actively goes against Chinese unity. This Cold War rhetoric and the anti-China posturing is dangerous. It serves political aims and fans racism at the expense of well-considered diplomacy country and around the globe. We on the left have an important role to play in cutting through the propaganda and the anti-Chinese sentiment. We need to be pushing. Um, I mostly agree again, um, but when I show publications or some uh, stuff said, it will just show a different light. <clears throat> Now, let's get to the talk in question. That video was a pretext, which I will go in, because I can, to, for me to go into other topics. Now, let's get to where Greens has violated this and actively promote attention. The year is 2005, and a Tibetan separatist publication praised, a separatist, um, praised, the Shane Greens, more so Michael Orgian, Senator Bob Brown, and Kerry Nettle. Those three individuals met with representatives from the exiled Tibetan government in India, which is the Dental Lama people, and also, alas, public fellow. <laughs> Things starts with the funding policy on Tibet was adopted by the Australian Greens during 2003 2004. It was prepared by Michael Organ H. M. H. R. and sent by Brown in consultation with Tibet, Tibet Information Office, Canberra. And the Dalai Lama's official website in Australia, Tenzin Bornzok Atza. 
The authors would encourage the mo- adoption of similar policies by political parties around the world and offer the, po- and offer the following policy as a model pun- to which develop such localised policies. <coughs> this is these people from the Fijian Greens as a representative of the greater separatist image. Notable lines is point six. The Greens commended Tibetan people and their leader, the His Holiness the Fourteenth Dalai Lama, for constantly rejecting the use of violence in search of a resolution to current peace to current situation in Tibet, and notes that he was acknowledged in the awarding of nineteen eighty nine Nobel Peace Prize to him. Yet that is slightly incorrect. As the Dalai Lama has supported self-emulations, which is a form of suicide. Point seven. The Greens expressed their continuing deep concern about widespread human rights abuses occurring in Tibet and called upon the government of peoples of China to respect the universal request of rights in Tibet. <laughs> the Greens called upon the people to attend China to release all Tibetan political prisoners. Point eight. Point nine. The Greens call on the government of people of China to open up Tibet to international human rights and humanitarian organizations and independent journalists. <clears throat> point, for, point 14. <clears throat> The Greens urged the Australian government to appoint a Tibet coordinator in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to look at issues concerning Tibet and liaison with the Chinese government and Dalai, and Dalai Lama or his, or his representatives. <clears throat> this would be a violation of the one China policy, essentially, and would then put at odds the whole principle of China. While the article says that the federal policy was adopted by the Greens in 2003-2004, it still happened and once was the policy line of the Australian Greens. The issue here doesn't end with the topic of Tibet and the temporary policy. The Cardinal of Lengong is also here with first center of Davis Shoebridge. In a 2016 article, he qu- the question was posed, is New South Wales Greens a political center for Fun and Gong? Uh, where, b- b- uh, where a bill he part proposed protected a major claim of the cult that of that is of organ harvesting. <laughs> quote, uh, quote, Fallen Gong protesters have been making their case in the streets for, for years and they have been used to be Ignored by past, used to be ignored by past, passers by. Greens, New South Wales leader uh, David Chubridge says they have been long ignored by the Australian pol- pol- political parties too. Chubridge this month introduced a private members' bill aimed at stopping people from, in New South Wales from going to China or anywhere else in the world that else where there was commercial transaction for organ transplants. Questions got, got by the article about links between the cult and the move. He said, <clears throat> Undoubtedly, we got, we got some support from Falun Gong community. But also from human rights organizations such as Australian Lawyers for Human Rights. Strong support for 
from the Vietnamese community as well. Academics from the, from New York City and Macquarie University. Later on in the article, it said. Said a previous petition called for the legislation received 249,745 signatures when Shoebridge introduced the bill to New South Wales Parliament. The gallery was filled with practitioners of, the, of Falun Gong. Those two are from 2005 and 2006. So let's jump to 2020 onwards. And the very fact that the whole room was filled with Falun Gong kind of proves the only people who cared was the Falun Gong. The Greens candidate in Tasmania, Cassie O'Connor, did an article in 2020. <clears throat> The article was on the name Tasmania must resist influence and reduce rely reliance on China. In the article, it said, since the Liberals had begun the aggressive pursuit of Chinese money, the Tasmanian Greens have warned them and of Labour of the dangers of overreliance on China and its government soft power in working Tas Tasmania. Bonservice has been best mockery. Um, at worst, accession of racism and xenophobia. We weather those ignorant, untrue statements because we regard our solemn duty to stand up for Tasmania and its people at every turn. Continuing its attack. Mainland Chinese in invested investment often comes with strings attached when you can when that can that can often undermine democracy, sovereignty, food security, and safety of those who fled the oppressive way regime for a chance for a good life in Australia. Too often our too often our political leaders can't see oh, past the Yuan tanks. The, they ignore Chinese government bad behavior, jailing of dissidents, racism towards foreigners and the cultural genocide of the Uyghurs. All in the name of attracting more Chinese cash. Continuing the US's rant, the Greens member said the Australian is, Australia is left in a lose-lose position either way. We, we silence up our official critique of China on a legitimate issue or, or Australia and, and every other state and territory in, fed, in the Federation suffers financially. This is why we should not have become beholden and increasingly sufficient to a irrational regime's good favour in the first place. The Tasmanian Liberal and parties have been dismissive of the concerns over the influence of soft power and dark money from China. They trot out lines of the Communist Party's propaganda specialists we're proud of. In doing so, they, they demonstrate this influence at work. This all coalescing outcome of in her final words. The take-home lesson from the Chinese Communist governments over threats and punitive actions should be that Tasmania needs serious reduction in its economic dependency on China. Uh, we cannot afford to have our economic security and moral compass held hostage by, by a totalitarian state with such miserable human rights track record and so little respect for the democratic states it relies on to feed its people. This is wrong in many ways, because is China trying to change Australia as they come? No. Would they have money coming in and money coming out? Yes, that, is mu that much is true. But are they trying to destroy our system? No. So when Jenny Leong, who exists in the same party as Cassie Schubert, Michael Organ, Senator Brown, and Kerry Nettle, who supports agitation on China and su support of banned Chinese cults, or the anti chan people, says that she what says in her correct speech is the inconsistency on of 
individual speaks more loudly than the message she wants to propose. In the final article, to my point, in my conclusion of Australian Greens policy hypocrisy was done in 2021. Again by Greens member, judging China was an attempt to balance out now to at least to neutrality once more. I didn't cover most of this, so you have to look at it yourself. With Sunshine Shantans within it. The article wanted to put a baseline of China's getting increasingly bad press, but is it wise to but is it it is wise to critically review what has been said? Uh, and by whom to avoid going down a pathway towards armed conflict, <clears throat> which isn't necessarily a bad image, but some really weird assumptions were said. Effects of the article is, there's interesting concerns that China is a autocracy with the current presidency likely to be there for a long time. Well, Australia, it's still a monarchy, which is essentially a, a intergenerational autocracy with its elected governments and still at the mercy of an elected monarchy, e.g. dismissal of Finland government in 1975. Any left-of-centre federal policy government elected in the future would need to keep look, looking over its shoulders. As well as, then there is Hong Kong, the one nation, two systems, said one, one country, two systems, officially, but I'll let it pass. Settlement was agreed between China and UK. The former colonial master of Hong Kong in 1997. So it's a bit late to argue for independence for Hong Kong. Could you say that? If China is changing two systems component, then it is incumbent that the UK to, up, to hold China to the 1997 agreement, which it actually isn't violating the one country, two systems agreement at all. When I was in China, there was a discussion on how and when China would take over Hong Kong. But with observations on, on how China was opening up after the Cultural Revolution, my prediction was China will not take over Hong Kong, and, but Hong Kong will take over China. This turned out to be true. As uh, so subsequent decades, China adopted a capitalist system similar to that of Hong Kong. Who would, dare, who would have thought that there'd be Chinese citizens as billionaires and oligarchs blessed by the Chinese Communist Party in the early 21st century? This point I find absolutely ridiculous because at the end of the day, it shows ignorance. Hong Kong needed that system because they, because the empire didn't give a shit about subsidies. They, Hong Kong had to pay money, a certain amount of money back to the UK. And if they wanted any money for themselves, they had to make extra money, which mean which meant making extra profits. So to say that China adopted that system is just wrong. Because oligarchs aren't in control. So that's ridiculous. With the article finishing with, would well, do a fandom of genuine democracy must confess that the one-party system of China has been more successful than the multi-party system of South Asia in raising masses out of, from abject poverty? A question I pondered myself since school days. I visited China again in the 1990s for a conference in Guangdong, uh, famous for Tiangdo beer, on the East Coast. In comparison with Kunming, Yunnan province, where I was based in 1982 to 84, I was gobsmacked, a ultra-modern city with people living relatively luxurious life, apparently. And now that applies to Kunming. In the present atmosphere of increasing bad press for China, I think it'd be wise for to step back a bit and critically examine 
It's on the press and widely published. If you really want to understand the thinking going on in China or any other country, it's best to listen to foreigners actually living amongst the Chinese people there. Um, relying on information that comes from the clustered confines of embassies and fleeting visits by journalists, or even worse, by shock jocks who have never visited a place amongst minutes can be misleading. That part I do agree with. All countries aside, the message proposed in the original video is an admirable. And, and, in, and I hope the principle of it will come true. But instead, I, as I've shown that with party seeking independent foreign policy, the thing she wanted dead is very much established within her own party she represents. Making the Greens, much like the other two, two major parties, first class hypocrites in some degree when they wanted to announce racism in a sincere manner. Alternatively, she could be mis mis misleading herself, given the wildcard nature of the Greens policy regarding China over the years. As the other side of seeking independent foreign policy does not guarantee actually supporting China or supporting peace with China. We will see uh, 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 this as we see with anti-existing socialism people where they fake emotions to get sympathy. So her having it genuine or not is to be seen with who and what she supports. But my hope is that she is genuine sentiment. For if she is genuine, then it then makes an then that makes a new thing here. That of her being naive in a way, being misled by others, thinking that the Greens could achieve such an ambition when most Australian political parties are anti-China by default. As the Chinese term goes, before paying to improve the world, first look around your own home three times. And also do not rely on alliances of vague motions and no ideals entirely without action. As left alone, that can be unstable. Idealism without a reality is nothing but a losing battle in the long haul.